Hello ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to talk about copyright. We've recently been contacted by a lawyer who prefers to go by the moniker Slate, who is interested in helping us make a video to describe how copyright law is supposed to work in theory, and how it actually works in practice. Now, if you're familiar with YouTube's copyright school, if either because you've been there or because you just visited out of curiosity, you may be aware that the video is frustrating, condescending, and not very informative. Well, we'd like to turn that around and make a video that actually provides some assistance to people who are interested in using YouTube. Now, one thing you might notice is that YouTube's copyright school is put together by the same guys who do Happy Tree Friends, and this is pretty apt because the characters get destroyed for pretty much no reason. It's completely run-of-the-mill to have your work attacked while you're on YouTube, and most of the time, it'll get attacked by YouTube itself. Moreover, we're also making this video because of some recent policy changes that have created a lot of stir in YouTube in general. Namely, YouTube's decision to strip networks of the ability to protect their people from getting content ID takedowns and other issues. Content ID is its own bag of worms and really has very little to do with copyright law in general. In fact, a lot of lawyers really scoff at the system and they probably wish they could slap YouTube in their face. Uh, however, what we're going to start with is actually how copyright works on paper, and then we're going to progress to how it works on YouTube, because the two are different, but it's very important to have a fundamental understanding of where to start. You can find most aspects of copyright law laid out in Article 1 of the Constitution. In the United States, any creative work that gets published is considered to have protection, which includes random stuff posted to YouTube. That means that technically speaking, even this video is protected by copyright law. Now, we're pretty loose about what we allow when we have a terms of use, we allow derivative works, we don't mind, but there are a lot of things that you could actually do with our video. For example, if you chopped our video up and made it into a musical remix, that would be a fully transformative work of the video, and you are allowed to do that. Now, we'll get into transformative uses in a second, but for now i just like to say that each copyright is granted to the whole work. Not to bite-sized sections of the work, not to little parts, the entire thing. That means that if somebody writes a song, they can't claim to own the individual components of the song. They can't claim to own the chord patterns. They have to claim the entire song. Additionally, every performance is considered unique, which means that if you play a public domain song like The Blue Danube, your performance The Blue Danube is considered copywritten. That's how cover songs are legal. As long as you pay royalties for the composition of the work, your performance of the work is your own, and you're allowed to produce as much revenue as you like from that. Now, of course, take careful note that I mentioned you have to pay royalties to the composition owner. How to do this is outlined in section 115 of the US copyright laws, but on YouTube, the standard system really isn't profitable. You'll also need to negotiate a sync license, so that's about as far as we're going to go in terms of cover music on YouTube. Uh, hopefully that'll give you a good place to start if you're interested. Uh, I will say that there are some networks that'll help you negotiate those licenses if you really want. But for now, let's proceed along into fair use claims. Now, fair use is probably not a very good term for it. You should probably scratch it out of your mind that fair use is, well, fair. It would be better described as a Section 107 claim. Section 107 of US copyright law describes how a copywritten work can be used without permission from the rights holder. Every copyright claim is unique, so there can be a number of factors that go into considering a case of fair use. However, one of the most prominent factors is whether or not you're competing with the original rights holder. The variable nature of a fair use claim is the reason why Let's Plays are considered to be an illegal gray area. On one hand, there's a strong argument that games are granted a copyright to the entire product, which is an interactive source of media. On the other hand, the game publishers want to claim that they own the rights to the entire thing, even the little parts such as the cutscenes. The game developers would like to argue that if people can make money by displaying their games or showing off their cutscenes, then they'd like to be the only ones capable of making that money. However, people who produce Let's Plays, especially for a living, would like to argue that the videos don't really stand up well on their own without the commentary. If you try to divorce the commentary from the gameplay, then you no longer have a Let's Play. So it's a bit of a disagreement, but game publishers have generally come to understand that most of these Let's Plays are beneficial to their sales. They create exposure and it's free advertising, it's good for them. Some independent developers actually go out of their way to contract popular Let's Players to do videos on their games. And while this is a good place to transition into how YouTube handles the problem, for right now it's probably better if we get into trademark law. And so for that, we've got our friend here, Kermit the Frog. Now, Kermit is a trademark character, but that doesn't mean that he can't show up in your work. In fact, that little Kermit toy shows up in a lot of videos that I've done. After all, like I mentioned, a copyright is granted to the whole work, not to the individual parts, which means that the characters themselves aren't copywritten. That also means that unique videos like our own Rainbow Dash Presents can't really be accused of copyright infringement. Likewise, fanfiction is also in the same boat, but you can be accused of trademark dilution. Trademark dilution is when you disassociate a character from the person that owns it, and this can be pretty difficult to do when you have a really large character owned by a really large company. 
That's why it's fairly rare for fanfiction writers to be taken down by rights holders. Sometimes rights holders do have to attack people because they can lose their trademarks, but generally it's not worth the effort. A really solid example of trademark dilution would be the Fighting as Magic game that got a cease and desist some while ago. It was a game that, without a license, represented Hasbro's trademark characters without making any kind of commentary on them or any kind of exempted use. Fighting as Magic certainly wasn't malicious, but it could have opened the door for people who were. Now, that brings us to copyright law in theory to copyright law in practice. Now, copyright law isn't actually that old. It was introduced sometime around the Industrial Revolution, and it hasn't been around that long. It's been changed a lot, and one of the most recent and controversial adaptations is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which was introduced almost primarily just to kill Napster, which is now dead. And in the wake of Napster's death, digital distribution has become more and more popular, and with that has come a wave of indescribable terror. This law, which was created without any understanding or scope of where the internet was headed, works in the following way. First, a company realizes that you've posted something they don't like. The next thing that happens is they ask the person hosting your content to take your work down. The third thing that happens is your work goes down. And that's pretty much it. There's no requirement for proof. There's no warrant. There's no trial. It's police power without oversight. You can dispute the claims, but content hosts aren't required to host your content, which means that some of them are willing to drop you like a rock the minute you get a claim. If you're dropped by the person who is hosting your website, then you have to migrate your whole website to a new service, and that's costly and time-consuming. Ultimately, the only people who are really safe from these kind of claims are the kind of people who can afford their own servers. If the content host doesn't agree to take down your work the minute they get a notice, then they're made legal liable, and none of them want to be legally liable. This is made all the worse by the fact that companies are now starting to use automated bots to make these takedown claims. This has led to completely inaccurate, although sometimes hilarious claims, such as when the UFC owners insisted that they held the rights to illegal underage gay porn. I mean, no one was acting to defend that one, but you have to admit that when things get that ridiculous, there might be something wrong with the law. But if you think that automated bots claiming gay porn for the UFC is ridiculous, try to imagine an entire platform that is controlled by automated bots. Welcome to YouTube. YouTube is probably even worse than the DMCA in terms of promoting fraud and exploitation. Aside from being completely automated and having no customer service to speak of, YouTube provides one incentive the DMCA doesn't. Money. When somebody uploads something to Content ID, Content ID scans its entire website to look for any match to that content. If they find it, the person who uploaded that content to Content ID gets paid. That is to say, the claimant uses an automated program to make mass claims on every video on YouTube that is in some way similar to their own. So when the bots claim gay porn for the UFC on YouTube, the UFC actually gets money every time somebody watches that gay porn. Not that pornography is actually allowed on YouTube, but the fact remains that the bots do make mistakes all the time. And because money is involved and these companies are given the ad revenue when they make this mistake, they're sometimes compelled to just sort of look the other way and pretend that they don't notice that they're causing the problem. And if you're wondering if this hurts YouTube, it doesn't. YouTube takes a cut from the earnings no matter who's making the profits, so they don't really seem to care that much. In response to the latest outrage over this program, YouTube has been completely unrepentant, insisting that you can just easily file a dispute. Unfortunately, what they don't tell you about their simple dispute process is that it's extremely risky. When you file a dispute, the company in question may relinquish your video, but that's kind of rare. More commonly, what you'll run into is a very large company without the resources to look at every million disputes that they get. What they may do is they might hire a hashing company. A hashing company is just a smaller company that reviews disputes and hashes out takedown requests. These people aren't paid that well, and they're not legal experts, so they don't always know what they're looking at, so they make a lot of mistakes. Companies may also opt for using a robot, because that's much cheaper. The robots will simply just reject every claim. So what happens when the claim is rejected? Well, YouTube gives the claimant company the ability to punish your channel for disputing. If the claimant pushes their own case, it can cause your channel to lose all ability to make money, functionally destroying everything. This has naturally opened the door for extortion and a lot of other types of fraud. One company that's gained particular notoriety is Rumblefish, who's uploaded bird songs to Content ID. This means that if you filmed outdoors and you heard certain kinds of birds, your video might have been pulled from the site until you agreed to pay a fee to Rumblefish for the bird song. So if you haven't guessed by now, and I'm sorry if you came to this video hoping I could tell you how to work with Content ID, there's actually nothing you can do to be safe from this system. Anyone can be attacked at any time for posting any kind of content. But YouTube always gets a cut. Whether it's fraud or a legitimate claim, YouTube gets a cut. So this system is not going anywhere. There used to be one option for safety on YouTube, and that was to join a network. That's why people would pay as much as half of their income to these networks, because these networks would provide a protection racket which would keep them from getting chased by these fraud companies. 
But in January, all those protective benefits are going to come to an end. Networks will still provide advantages, but nothing near the worth of the gigantic cut that they take. Furthermore, network partners will once again become susceptible to YouTube's automated inquisitorial program. This is a program that will randomly freeze the earning potential on videos, demanding that the owner provide proof of their innocence without really citing what crime may have been committed. Even if you filed with the US Copyright Office, there's no guarantee that YouTube's automated program will recognize your rights. Our channel has lost a ton of videos to this program, including one of our most popular, and we absolutely dread having to deal with it again. It seems to hate music especially, but I haven't been able to figure it out. But I do know that if you ignore it, you're actually penalized and more likely to be flagged by it again. So if anyone complains that people on YouTube are just childish and not doing any real work and they should stop complaining, you should maybe correct them. Because if you get caught by Content ID or you get in a snowball with this inquisitorial program, everything's gone. As for why YouTube is cutting the legs out from underneath these networks and making their contracts somewhat detrimental, I have a theory. Obviously all the issues with IP law is a factor, but it might also be a convenient excuse. Quite recently, Maker Studios, one of the largest networks on YouTube, has just acquired Blip. The word is, they're now preparing themselves to become a legitimate competitor with YouTube. The problem is, Maker is still pretty reliant on YouTube for their earning potential. So if YouTube can destroy or hamper that severely enough, it'll really hurt Maker's ability to finance their new venture. Or in other words, a network may have flown too close to the sun, and now Google is burning everyone. They're melting those wings, and everyone on that ride is going down. It's not too crazy to think that we might just be sacrificial pawns in a larger corporate game, especially given how much market control Google has over this service. As one final hurrah, one last kick in the teeth, I bet a lot of you are thinking that we should go to court. You know, we should do something. We've got to hold somebody accountable for all this nonsense that's going on. Well, the problem is that most YouTubers don't make enough money from YouTube to justify the legal expense of going to court over it. And in cases where you try to put together a class action lawsuit, imagine yourself with a thousand people, each one has one video, and each video is about 10 minutes long. That is 10,000 minutes of footage that the legal system has to review to verify the veracity of the copyright claims that these people are making. The US court system actually collapses under the weight of all these problems. There is no way to resolve it through conventional means. So the only thing we can do is just hold on for dear life and hope that the ride goes somewhere good. I'm Greg Hoffman, and this has been The Real YouTube Copyright School.